And Matthew Curry is a th also a third-year microbiology student volunteering at Dr. Rossellimo's lab. And we'll be speaking on new data on the presence of old bacteria in Nova Scotian ticks. Please join me in welcoming Matthew. Um, so my name is Matthew Curry. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Rossellimo lab, and I'm in my third year at Dalhousie. And so I'm going to give you guys a bit of an update about the work we've been doing, um, specifically with the prevalence of diseases in uh, Exodus scapularis, as well as Dermacenter variabilis. OK, um, actually, r quickly before I start to get into my presentation, I was just curious to see, um, could everyone here who has experienced um, a tick-based infection or has a family member who's experienced a tick-based infection, could you please put your hands up just so we get a visual? Wow, OK. <laughs> um, and so just quickly, uh, with your hands still up, I would ask everyone um, who had trouble receiving their diagnosis or felt that there was a significant barrier to keep their hand up, wave it if you have to. OK, so. Thank you. Um, you can put your hands down now, but this just kind of highlights uh, the importance of some of the research that we're doing. So, like this? Okay. <laughs> so, um, the focus with prevalence-based research is that we could one day get an exact number. So, if you're bitten by this tick um, at this time with these conditions, we could determine the exact risk of developing that disease, um, not just specific to Lyme disease, but for a host of other infections. And so, with this information, we could hopefully create uh, better public policy as well as um, a more infor informed public. So um, today for my presentation, I'm going to be talking about the prevalence of disease within the parasite itself, but I will not be talking about uh, the rate of transmission or the vector efficiency. So just keep that in the back of your heads as I'm going along. And so um, when I'm talking about the prevalence of the pathogen within the vector or within the parasite, uh, I'm going to be focusing on two main questions, and that is how does it vary uh, between species, like between species of the parasite, um, and how does it vary uh, between different, uh, so uh, over different time periods? Okay, so that being said, um, we're going to quickly talk about uh, the different types of ticks. Thankfully, Taylor did the bulk of uh, the work for me already. Um, we're going to mention the diseases that they carry. I'll explain the methods that we use to test for the diseases. Uh, I'll tell you about our current results, um, as well as some of the past ones from 2016 and a little bit earlier. And then to top it up, if I still have time because I talk a little slow, um, we will hopefully look at the future directions as well. OK, so these are the two ticks that I'm going to be talking about. These are the most common ones that we see in our lab, as well as the most common ones in Nova Scotia. These are Exodus scapularis and Dermacenter variabilis. And so Dermacenter is shown on the left, Exodus on the right. These are both females, but you already knew that from Taylor's presentation. Now, um, underneath each of them, I've lift, listed some of the uh, infections or some of the bacteria that can act as pathogens um, that these species act as vectors for. And I'd like to call to everyone's attention that the first three in each list um, are the same for both species. So these three can be transmitted by both of the most uh, prevalent species of ticks in Nova Scotia. Um, the ones below those three are a little bit more interesting. So I wanted to talk about two that are uh, transmitted by Exota scapularis, but not Dermacenter variabilis, as well as one that's transmitted by the Dermacenter, but not Exodus. So that's a lot of information. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a background on each of these uh, infections slash pathogens so you kind of have um, some context for when I'm giving you these stats. Um, it kind of makes it more valuable or makes it a little bit more real. OK, so the first one up is Francisella tularensis. And so what you have to understand with Francisella tularensis is that it is a bacteria. Um, you can be infected with this through either blood-to-blood uh, -blood contact, contaminated water, or aerosol. And so um, when this bacteria infects you, it causes a disease called uh, tularemia. And tularemia can come in two forms. So from a tick bite, you'll likely see um, a skin infection, but it can also come in the form of uh, pneumonia, which is from the aerosol. And so a little bit of an interesting fun fact about Francisella tularensis is that it was actually selected by the US as a biological weapon in the 1950s. So it's a great thing that we have that floating around in the province. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, the second of the uh, co or vectored by both species um, pathogen is Bartonella species. And so Bartonella um, itself is actually a genus. There's many different members of this, uh, but generally um, what you can expect from members that cause infection are flu-like symptoms and the characteristic swelling of the lymph nodes. I tried to show with this picture down here. Can you see that? Ooh. 
Okay, um, so that's Bartonella species. And the last of the uh, common or uh, vectored by both species is Rickettsia species. Now, you might be a little bit more familiar with Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. This is uh, belonging to the Rickettsia genus. Um, and so what you can expect from something such as Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, again, are these flu-like symptoms, but with an accompanying rash. And so I'd just like to uh, mention clinically and for uh, public awareness that these infections can occur without all the symptoms present, um, as I'm sure many people in the room are well aware of this. Uh, I'm also going to talk about Babesia species. So Babesia, um, I know we had a question about that uh, during our last presentation. Um, so this is not transmitted by dermacenter, but it is transmitted by Exodus scapularis. And so what's interesting about Babesia is that it's not a, it's not a bacteria at all, actually. Um, it's a form of protozoan, and so it's an obligate intracellular parasite, which is just a fancy way of saying that it has to live inside and consume our red blood cells. Um, so the reason why you should be concerned with that, other than the fact that it's kind of creepy, um, is that they can cause something called hemolytic anemia, which again is the fever-like symptoms, um, but with also a great decrease in energy and a host of other problems. Okay, um, <laughs> this is the kind of the conference, or like, this is the culprit of why we're at this whole conference. I'm not going to spend too, too much time about this. Um, there's many people in the room who either have this disease, have relatives with this disease, and probably know a little bit more than I do. Um, so I'm just going to touch on this. I wanted to really um, send home the message that this is a bacteria and not a virus. Um, for those of you who were with me at my last presentation, um, would have seen that news article that tried to say otherwise. I'm not sure uh, what their goal was with that. Okay, and so the last uh, pathogen that I'd like to talk about, uh, this one's interesting for two reasons. One is that it is transmitted by dermacenter. This is our dermacenter variable specific pathogen. Um, and it also, it, instead of infecting red blood cells, as we'd see in Babesia, this actually infects white blood cells. And so um, it can be described as causing the same symptoms as Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, but without that characteristic rash. Okay. So for those of you who are still awake, I'm going to talk about our methods now. Uh, and so in order to do all these experiments to find out prevalence data, we have to first get our ticks. And so um, thankfully for us, we have an amazing um, veterinary support as well as public support. And so they'll send in a lot of ticks from across the province. Um, and that really keeps our lab going because we get the majority of our ticks from this source. However, we do do, we do, do our own collection as well. And so in order to do this, we go out and we take these um, essentially glorified white pieces of cloth and we just drag them along the ground. That's, that part's not overly complicated. What is complicated, though, is deciding when to do it. So um, for those of you who don't know, ticks are most sensitive to desiccation and humidity. So you have to choose a point in the, uh, point in the day when it's not uh, overly dry outside. And so for us, that's often at dusk. Now, uh, if we have two volunteers going for an hour, we'll probably get about like 30-ish ticks on average, um, and that's just in one hour with two volunteers. So that gives you an idea of just how many ticks are uh, around our local communities. And then, so once we have um, our ticks collected, we bring them into the lab, we do a host of experiments, um, and then it becomes our job to crush up these ticks and perform a DNA extraction. Uh, which is as fun as it sounds, because you just have to crush them up and then put a bunch of stuff in the pot and see what happens. Um, the thing to know about this is that it just sucks out all the DNA from the sample, and so that's not just DNA from the tick, that's also DNA from the pathogen. And using that DNA, we can actually test uh, for the presence of the pathogen. For those of you who aren't familiar, we then use um, a technique called polymerase chain reaction, and so this is just a really fancy way to test for a specific piece of DNA um, by using these specific primers that we buy. I put up a slide of the different primers that we use, but I don't think I'm going to go through it. We'd probably be here for a much longer uh, time than I have. Five minutes left, fair enough. Um, so I'll just quickly mention that for Borrelia species, we actually use two different primers. So we use um, a primer that tests for a gene, which encodes for outer surface protein A, um, as well as another primer that tests for a separate gene, which encodes for a flagellin A. Okay. So now that we have kind of the nitty gritty out of the way, I can start talking about, oh, one more. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to um, fully finish this test, you take your PCR results and you put this into what's called uh, an agrose gel. And think of this as just kind of like a large or a small molecular sieve. And so the theory behind this says that um, 
the multiplied regions are smaller than the whole genome, so they'll run a little bit further. And then you can see kind of on this, or maybe I'll use the pointer, um, we can see positive results just in the little bands here. Okay, so that's the nitty gritty. Here's what we got. Um, so since 2012, we've tested like roughly under 2,000 ticks. Um, 1,215 of those have been dermocenter variabilis, 716 have been exota scapularis. And so what did we test them for? Well, um, before we did any genetics work, we looked at their seasonal, seasonal distributions, um, and we're very interested to find that it's actually not equal, and they seem to be almost inversely proportionate to each other. So um, our dermocenter species are a lot more prevalent in the spring months, um, and exodus are a lot more prevalent in the fall months. Now, why is this important? Why should we care about this? Well, as we're, we're all aware, um, exodus scapularis can transmit Lyme disease, and so most people are chiefly concerned with exodus scapularis. And so you can see how a misconception could develop looking at the data saying, well, I don't see a high prevalence of exodus scapularis in the spring, so I shouldn't be concerned about tick-based disease, correct? Um, well, actually, that would be wrong. And so in 2016, we set out to answer that question, just what diseases should we be concerned with? And this is what we found. So we tested for four different bacteria, um, Bartonella, Rickettsia, Francisella tularensis, and Anaplasma phagocytophilum. Um, and so we got positive results for all of these, which was amazing and concerning at the same time. Um, as you can see, Bartonella was huge. Um, there's a very high prevalence, uh, but we suspect that there's probably a lot of false positives there. Um, Rickettsia was also very prevalent. Um, there was some Francisella tularensis, our biological weapon agent, um, and some Anaplasma phagocytophilum. Okay, um, and then the question became, so that's our dermocenter, how does Exodus compare? Well, in 2016, we were very busy because we also looked at Exodus. And so as you can see from this graph, we tested for three different bacteria, um, our Lyme disease, Bartonella, and Rickettsia. Uh, Bartonella, again, very high rates. Um, we were beginning to get, become very suspicious that there was false positives here. Um, but Rickettsia was a little bit lower, but still quite prevalent uh, along with Lyme disease. And so um, with our Lyme disease, that's, that's a roughly 20% prevalence, which translates to about one in five ticks that we tested having Lyme disease, or at least the bacteria which could cause it. Okay, um, and then so this graph just shows a quick update. 2017, we're curious, what would happen if we tested um, for a different year? Would these, pre would these uh, prevalences stay the same? How would they change? And so what we saw when we tested for a few different bacteria um, is that there was a general decrease. And just to kind of highlight this, I made a graph quickly to show. Um, this is just a graph using the 2016, 2017 uh, data for Exodus scapularis, and it shows an overall decrease um, in Bartonella and Lyme disease. So we have to be very careful with this. This is still very preliminary, um, but it would be exciting to take this and say, wow, look, our Lyme disease prevention programs or our pet vaccination programs are doing amazing. Uh, but again, this is still very preliminary. The research is ongoing. Um, and this is kind of indicative of areas that we should continue to research. Okay, and then the last question we wanted to address is, how does the prevalence of disease compare between our dermocenter and our exodus? Um, so for the three that could be transmitted for both of them, uh, we just compared our prevalences that we found in our past data. And what we saw is that Dermacenter actually um, outcompeted or uh, had higher prevalences in all the ones we tested than Exodus scapularis, which is kind of crazy to think um, that Exodus is the one that we're chiefly concerned with if Dermacenter is testing to be so much more prevalent with these diseases, right? It's, it's a little eye-opening. And so, having said that, um, what, does, what does all this mean? Well, so all the organisms that we tested for were found in Nova Scotia, but we didn't test for all the possible pathogens. We had a very limited uh, scope, right? So if we tested for all poth possible pathogens, what else would we find in these ticks? Um, Dermocenter variabilis had higher prevalence than Exodus scapularis, yet we're still chiefly concerned with Exodus scapularis. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned with Exodus scapularis. That is not true at all. It transmits Lyme disease, which is very dangerous. Um, but we should also include uh, the uh, view of other pathogens in our concern. And then finally, Bartonella appeared to be the most prevalent. However, uh, further research should, should uh, validate these claims and see if there's any false positives at play. 
uh, future directions. We're going to look at vector efficiency, as I said, uh, co-infection. We're going to try and sequence amplicons. And we also want to expand our scope a little bit to see if there's um, similar diseases in other arthropods, so ticks and mites, or mites and mosquitoes and such. Okay, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Tatiana Rossellino, Dr. Vetloy, Dr. Ben Boucher, Mount Allison University, um, the Marine Gene Pro Blank Lab where we do a lot of our work, um, Dalhousie University, and all the veterans and volunteers that contribute to this research. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>